Please take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate that. Matthew chapter 21, in just a moment, I'll start reading from verse 23. And when you find Matthew 21, verse 23, uh, look on the screens just a minute. How many of you ever seen this bumper sticker? Anybody ever seen that? Oh, there's a Corolla. How about that? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the question authority. That guy needs to get a new paint job, doesn't he? But anyway, that to me is indicative of the world. Adam and Eve sinned because they questioned the authority of God. Question authority. We live in a world that has a problem with God-ordained authority. Consequently, children don't like parents telling them what to do, and because of that, there's chaos between children and parents. Other children don't like teachers telling them what to do. Because of that, there is chaos in many of our schools. A lot of citizens don't like governmental officials telling them what to do. And because of that, many times there's chaos in many of our cities and even in our nation. The Bible says that Jesus has all authority. Jesus has all authority. He said that in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came up in his resurrected state and say, was saying to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He doesn't just have authority on earth. He has authority even in the heavens. And right after that is when he gave the great commission. How could he give the great commission? He had all authority. And he went on to say in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus Christ has all authority, and He has set up a world where there is authority. And when you submit to God-ordained authority, it doesn't mean that you lose your freedom. It means that you come under the protective hedge of God. And if you rebel against God-ordained authority, it means you come out from under that protection of God-ordained authority, and you are an easy, easy victim for the devil himself. Jesus was explaining authority one day when some people came along and questioned his authority. Maybe you question the authority of God. Who does God think He is to tell me what to do? Who does Jesus think He is to tell me what to do? What is the Bible? Why is the, why is the Bible supposedly authoritative? Why, how is this? And can this be abused? And all the questions that go with that. Let's talk tonight about the authority of Jesus. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 23. When he, Jesus, entered the temple. The chief priest and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? We'll talk about these things momentarily. And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus is about to answer their question with a better question. The baptism of John, that's John the Baptist, was from what source, from heaven or from men? There's the question we're studying on Sunday night, the questions of Jesus, finding answers in the questions of Jesus. And they began reasoning among themselves saying, if we say that His authority was from heaven, he, Jesus, will say to us, then why did you not believe John? But if we say his authority was from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a legitimate prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. He also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he went on to talk about the vineyard and on and on. Let's talk a little bit about the authority 
of Jesus. And the uh, Bible says, first of all, Jesus' authority irritates scoffers. It irritates scoffers. Notice verse 23, when he had entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching, he said, and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? People don't like it when you mess around with their lives. They don't like people to mess with them, and they don't even like God to interfere with their lives. They don't like Jesus messing up the waters. And these Jewish religious leaders really didn't like that at all. If you read the prior verses in this chapter, Jesus was irritating them in several ways. First of all, he had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey proclaiming to be the Jewish Messiah. If you go back up in chapter 21, look at verse 8 and 9. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When you go to Israel, you go to the top of the mountain where Jesus was when he was praying and he was there on, on, on the Mount of Olives and when he rode into town, he rode down in the Kidron Valley and when he started up toward the eastern gate where he would come in on that donkey, all these people began to shout to him and call him the Messiah and that irritated the Jewish religious leaders no end. They couldn't believe that these people were thinking that Jesus, this untrained, itinerant, radical rabbi, could even come close to fulfilling the Scriptures regarding Messiah. There's another thing that irritated them, not only him coming into town like that and all those people shouting out messianic praise to him, but secondly, when Jesus got to town, he went to the temple, but didn't establish himself as the Messiah. Rather, he clean, cleaned house. He cleansed the temple. He went in, and he went in where they were in the courtroom of the Gentiles, which was the only place the Gentiles could pray, and they had all of their sacrificial paraphernalia, and they were ripping the people off, charging them exorbitant prices for when they would come at the Passover and other things like Pentecost, and they would have to sacrifice. They were charging them inordinate amounts. And so Jesus goes in there, and obviously the Gentiles can't pray because there's all this business being done there in the Gentile court. And so he starts taking the tables of money and turning them over. And the Bible says in another gospel that he got a whip and got after them. I heard somebody say one time, well, he didn't hit anybody. That's because they got out of the way. I mean, this is a guy with some authority. He just went in there and busted the whole thing up. Can you imagine what they were thinking? Who does this guy think he is? Oh, but there was something else, and we read about that. I, I will read it to you very quickly. In chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, when he cleansed the temple, Jesus entered the temple, drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturned the tables of money changers, the seats of those who were selling doves. And the doves were the, being sold to the poorest people. Jesus didn't like them being offended. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a robber's den. And then thirdly, there was another thing that Jesus did that the religious leaders didn't like at all. He allowed the outcast of society to come into the temple and be ministered to. They weren't supposed to, according to the, the book of Leviticus. They, people like this weren't supposed to come in, but Jesus said, you know what? It's a new day. There's a new covenant, and you can come in through me. And listen to who, who he invited in. The blind, Matthew 21, 14. Go back up there. The blind and the lame. They were not permitted normally to come in, but Jesus brought them in. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he 
healed them. Now, what are you going to do about that? Because now they're not blind anymore. Now they're not lame anymore. You don't have any excuse now to keep them out. Aren't you glad that Jesus pulls people in that other people want to keep out? Aren't you glad that God loves people that other people want to throw away? God loves them. Jesus loves them, wants to pull them in. You better be glad because we're all a bunch of sinners that need for God to pull us in. They didn't like that. They didn't like him bringing these people, these outcasts into the temple. They thought he was defiling the temple. The fourth thing, when the Jewish religious leaders tried to get him to stop the people and the children from shouting out on the road that he was the Messiah, Jesus refused. He just said, I'm not going to do it. Look at chapter 21, look at verses 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, the children were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, I do. Have you never read? Now that was a loving rebuke because these were the most well-read people in all of the land. And he said, haven't you read your scriptures? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, God has prepared praise for himself. There was one more subtle thing that he had done. Fifth thing, he had cursed a fruitless fig tree. There was a picture of God calling the Jewish nation at that time fruitless, because they had rejected the Messiah. Look at Matthew 21, verses 17 and following. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany. He spent the night there. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it, found nothing on it except leaves only. It's just like Judaism when he found it in the first century. There was no fruit in it. It was leaves only. He said to it, no longer shall they there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and they asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and you don't doubt, you'll, say, you'll, do, you'll not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Jesus, authority, irritates scoffers. People that scoff at God, people that scoff at the Word of God, they don't like the teachings of Jesus. They like their little made-up concept of Jesus, but they don't like the real Jesus. Let me give you an example. Jesus said the only kind of marriage that is legitimate in the eyes of God is heterosexual monogamous marriage. One man and one woman. Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. He also taught it in Matthew chapter 19. And he got it from the earliest book of the Bible when Moses said regarding marriage, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Jesus said, that's the kind of marriage that is honorable in the eyes of God. And I want to say this to you. It absolutely infuriates people today if you teach that. They say, you're filled with hate. Look at me. Just because we might disagree with each other doesn't mean I hate you. I may not agree with your position, but I'm going to love you. And if you don't love me, I got news for you. You may push me out of your circle, but I'm going to make my circle bigger and get you back in my circle. So whether you're in my circle or whether I'm in your circle is not the point. You're in mine because I'm going to make sure that I love you, but I'm going to love you enough to teach you the truth, not just what man says, but what God says, because this book is our authority, not just what we say, but what God says. Jesus' authority, authority irritates scoffers. Well, let me move on. Jesus' authority also originates with God. Where does Jesus' authority come from? It comes from God. Look at verse 24 in Matthew 21. Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also ask you by what authority I do these things. 
The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? I can just imagine these guys saying, you can't ask us a question. We ask you a question first. I can hear Jesus saying, I asked you a better question. Answer me and I'll answer you because your answer, if you answer it correctly, will be the correct answer that I would give you. If you answer what I ask you, where did John's authority come from? If you say it's from God, that's where mine comes from. But I want to see how you answer this. I want to see you in front of all these people that have surrounded us right now. Obviously, they were there because they were fearing the people. They began reasoning among themselves, verse 25, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, we don't know, which was a lie. They knew. They knew that John's authority came from God. They just didn't want to admit it. He also said to them, though, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. It's hard to overstate just how popular John the Baptist was. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. John the Baptist was the first prophet who had preached a real prophet since Malachi 400 years before John the Baptist. There had been a complete silence for four centuries from God. God had not spoken one word through any prophet, through any vision, through any dream. There was no, prof no prophecy from the end of Malachi to John the Baptist, a 400-year span. But the last chapter of the Old Testament said that God was going to raise up an Elijah figure and he would be the next prophet. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6 says it, but I say to you, Elijah, no, no, wait, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And Jesus said, John the Baptist was that Elijah. He said in Matthew 17, 12 and 13, but I say to you that Elijah has already come. They did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that Jesus had spoken to them about John the Baptist. These Old Testament scriptures being fulfilled in John demonstrate that John's authority was from God. And Jesus, when he said, I'll also ask you a question if you tell me. I'll also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source, from heaven or from men? He was saying, my authority and John's authority are the same. We both received our authority from God himself. Yet Jesus put these guys in a tight spot because they couldn't go either way and get what they wanted. So they said, we don't know. Jesus said, I won't tell you because you know John's authority came from God and my authority comes from the same place that John's did. My authority is from God. Jesus was God in the flesh. Now look at the last thing. Jesus' authority irritates scoffers it, or it originates with God. Here's something you don't think of a lot. A lot of times think, people think, well, Jesus came to bring peace among all people. Jesus just wants us all to have peace. That's not what the Bible teaches. Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus came to divide humanity. Some of y'all are looking at me like, don't you know, Brother Steve, the Christmas song, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men? Well, that's not what the Greek text says. The Greek text says, peace among men with whom God is pleased. And who is God pleased with? With everybody? No, He's not pleased with people who don't receive His Son as Lord and Savior. So God sent Jesus not just to bring kumbaya peace, but to bring a solemn division. And you say, I don't believe it. Hear him speak himself. He divides humanity. Look at verses 28 through 32. But what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first. He said, son, go work today in the vineyard. He answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted what he said, and he went. 
The man came to the second son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. How many of you told your kids something? They said, oh, yeah, Dad, I'll do that, and they didn't do it. Please get your hand up because I'm raising mine. All right. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you, John the Baptist came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you seeing this did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe in him. Jesus said, I've come to save sinners that know they're sinners. And they want God to work in their life. But these Jewish religious leaders felt like they had the religion part down so well that they didn't need God. They didn't need salvation. They didn't need forgiveness. They felt that their religion was enough. They had religion down, but they had no relationship, real relationship with God. But Jesus said the tax collectors, the the prostitutes who believe, they're the ones that will get into the kingdom before you. Those were revolutionary words in Jesus' day, and they still are. These were words that could not, could, that could rather get a person killed, and they did. Jesus was crucified for talking like this, but He said that His authority divided mankind. Earlier in Matthew, He said this in Matthew 10, verses 32 and following, Therefore, everyone who confesses Me before men, I will confess him before My Father who is in heaven. I want to ask you, have you done that? Have you confessed Christ before men? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins and believed savingly in Jesus Christ and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian because Jesus said, if you don't confess him, if you don't let others know that you're willing, you're his willing servant, if you, if you don't let it be known that you're a Christian, if you try to hide on this thing, Jesus said, that's not going to cut it. That's not kind of the confession I'm looking for. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. What does that mean, Brother Steve? It means what it says. If you deny Jesus, he will deny you. And look at verse 34. Oh, my. Can we read this out loud? Read it with me. Here we go. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. What does a sword do? It divides. Does it not? I'm asking you a question. A sword divides. Jesus has divided Memphis. Jesus has divided America. Jesus has divided the world. Jesus did not come to give societal peace. Jesus came to give salvation peace. And Jesus does not divide the world like we do. Oh, we've got our divisions. Black and white. Rich or poor. Educated, uneducated, Democrat, Republican, North or South, conservative or liberal, right or left, gospel knows nothing about any of that. Here's how God divides humanity through Jesus. Here it is, saved or lost. On your way to heaven, when you die, or on your way to hell. Sheeps, sheeps, sheep. I guess sheeps, that's really a lot of sheep, amen? That's a double plural right there. Sheep or goats, on God's left hand destined for wrath, or on His right hand destined for for salvation in eternity. So I want to ask you, His authority 
divides humanity, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Maybe tonight Jesus' authoritative say, sayings have irritated you. You don't like this. You don't like some preacher saying, God has the right to decide where you spend eternity based on what you do with His Son, Jesus Christ. But I want to say to you as lovingly as I can, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. You are not guaranteed heaven on your own. You have to humble yourself before Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, ask for His forgiveness, receive Him as your Lord and Savior, believe that He died for your sins, paid the price for your sins, rose from the dead to give you eternal life, and ask Him to come into your life. And look at me, it is by grace you don't deserve to go to heaven, and neither do I. It is by grace we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. You have to come humbly and say, Lord, I don't deserve to go to heaven, but Jesus died on the cross for me, and He shed His blood for me. And because of that, His sacrifice and the fact that He raised, was raised from the dead, that's the only hope I have. I can't be good enough. I can't do enough. I can't do it, God. I am literally in the miry clay, and I can't pull myself out. So please, when I can't come to you, Thank you that you came to me through Jesus. Please, Lord Jesus, I humbly ask you, pull me out of the miry clay, set my feet on the rock of salvation, put a new song in my heart of the Holy Spirit, a song of praise to my God. God, if you don't save me, I can't get saved, but God, I ask you to save me. When you start talking to God like that, instead of, t instead of telling God what you're gonna, you want Him to do all the time, and instead of telling God what He has to do, I got news for you. When you start talking to God humbly, you get something. When you start talking to God proudly, you get nothing. You get nothing. You say, this offends me. That's the gospel. It's the gospel. It is the gospel. Jesus' authority originates with God. He got all of His authority from God. And He divides humanity. Saved or lost? Saved or lost? They tell us that in London, after the Titanic sank, there was a list in London of all the people. It told how many people were on the boat, and it said whatever that number was, this many souls, that's what it said, this many souls. And there were two columns, saved, lost. Folks, somewhere in heaven, there's two columns. This many souls, saved and lost. Jesus, where do you get your authority? Same place John the Baptist got his. Where do you believe John the Baptist got his? Well, I don't know. Neither will I tell you where I got my authority. But I want you to know this. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you will humble yourself before me and repent of your sins and confess that you need me to save you, I will save you. But if you reject me, the prostitutes... The outcast of life that come to me in humility and repentance, they will get into heaven and you won't. My authority decides who gets into heaven and only those who humble themselves and repent get in. I pray that tonight, can you handle this? I pray you will submit not to my authority. Oh, no. I pray that you will submit. You say, I don't like this. I'm going to say it to you anyway. You need to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ if you want to go to heaven when you die. If you want to be a Christian, you are not a Christian because you go to a Christian church. You're not a car because you sit in a garage. And you're not a Christian because you sit in a church building. You're a Christian because you have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
you have submitted to his authority. When it comes to God, don't question authority. Bow before him and receive his forgiveness. And you'll know what Jesus' authority is all about. Amen? Let's pray. And if you're wondering, I preached for 30 minutes on the dot. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Bless now this time of invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.